pillar students. This is your good buddy, Dennis Lindsay, and I welcome you into our class. A little different than in the past, but the Lord is here and that's the most important thing. I would encourage you, in spite of what the enemy is doing, to have hope, faith, and the joy of the Lord. Now, we're gonna share a video today, and the video I saw about 35 years ago, and I remember when I saw it and how he, how this well-known minister was lamb blasted for his prophetic word. Now, he, in, the, in, the, in the message, he says, it's not a, I'm not a prophet, but everybody just downplayed his message. And I think, I, I, I think we all need to see it again because it's in the timing of what's happening right now. And just before we show it, I'm gonna show a little video that I just saw over the weekend. I said, what in the world, Lord, are you doing? Well, the Lord is preparing us for the end time. So it's very obvious we know that. And something in the world is going on and Satan knows he has just a little bit of time left. That's why it's such an outcry. But this little video will explain that the Lord's in charge. He knows what's going on. We are not to fear, but we are to hope. He always tells his prophets, his people, if they will trust him and walk with him, he shows what's about to happen, what's coming. So I would encourage you today, take these, uh, take these video clips that we're gonna see. It's amazing. David Wilkerson is the person I'm talking about 35 years ago and his message, and you probably have seen it, but we're gonna see it again today. And just before we do it, we're gonna look at something that is revolutionary, a Bible a story about a Bible. So I would encourage you. Yes, the Lord's in charge. He always gives us uh, what is about to happen to come on the world, understanding, preparing us. So the most important thing is be ready. We don't know exactly what all the different theologians are saying about the end times. Everybody has different opinions, but the Lord just says, be ready for my coming. And it's close to hand. So I bless you in Jesus' name, and I thank you, Lord Jesus, for this class, for the students that are sticking it out and taking it online. You're preparing this generation for a new order of evangelism, and I pray that it gets down in their heart and they take what they've learned here to the ends of the world, and then we'll hear the testimonies and the amazing stories of your divine guidance and divine protection and divine miracles. So I pray this for your glory, Jesus. Take charge, I pray in Jesus' name. Okay, we're gonna roll the first one, the Bible of our president, Donald Trump. Blessings. And everybody said, amen. There was a great revival in the Hebrides in the early, 1900s, began to move, moved up to the pleading for it into the 40s. Maybe we could say it topped out in the early 50s. Two old women, one was 84 years old and one was 82 years old. One was blind and one was humped over so badly with spinal stenosis just, just arched over but they had passion for revival. They wanted God to work. This, this is what happened. They couldn't even get out to the church to pray. They couldn't even get out to the church to worship. Their house became a place to meet. People came in. They got so passionate about revival coming to the, their isle, the Isle of Lewis. They got so passionate about it. They confronted the preacher and wanted to know if he was thoroughly right with God. <laughs> And they prayed and prayed and prayed. And they'd seen the Lord, they said, with the church filled up and God blessing a great overflow. And the fire of God struck that tiny little obscure place off the coast of Scotland. And when it happened, there was a young teenage boy that got saved in it. His name was Donald, and the preacher became so dependent upon Donald and so close to Donald, he would ask him to lead in public prayers and help him with the meetings, and he did. Oh, how God worked. People began to hear about it, and the revival fire spread. 
it spread. And God blessed in a, in a great way. Those two old women, the people, kind of people, people don't want in their church anymore. And from that same island, there was a, a young girl who was a cousin to Donald Smith, who immigrated to America. Her name was Marianne Smith McLeod. She came to America and in 1936. She met a man named Fred, and they were married. They fell in love. They were married. God blessed in a great way. And those old women were her aunts. And they came out of that fiery revival, that fiery revival. They really experienced revival. And they sent a Bible, a copy of the Word of God that had been used in a special way in that revival to Mary Ann. She started having children. I think it was 1937, she had her first child. They named him after his father, Fred. Then she had her second child, named after herself, Mary Ann. Then she had her third child, Elizabeth. Then she had her fourth child. And she was so impacted by this teenage boy God had used in that revival of the Hebrides. She named him Donald. And she gave him that Bible, the Hebrides Revival Bible. He was born in 1946. He's now the 45th president of the United States. And that Revival Bible is in the Oval Office. I'm saying to you, I don't know how, why, I don't know how it all comes together. But I, but I believe God is putting some things together to give us just a window, just a window. If he, if he could find some open people who know what the wind is for. Can this be the time the wind is open? Providentially, God has prepared the moment and we will become the people of prayer, pleading with God. This is a plea. Will thou not revive us again? Will you, will you, will you be a part of that? Will you? I have a prophetic word this morning. Uh, it's been quite a while since the Lord has entrusted me to bring a prophetic message, but this is very strong in my heart. I want you to turn to Isaiah 24. Isaiah 24, my message, in one hour, everything's going to change. In one hour. 24th chapter of Isaiah. I'm going to read just the first few verses. Then you leave your Bible open because I'm going to keep coming back to this. It's the prophecy is all here. It's not my prophecy. It's, I, it's the Lord's prophecy given through Isaiah, his holy prophet. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste and turns it upside down and scatters abroad the inhabitants thereof. It shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with his master. With the maid, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, the seller, as with the lender, the borrower, as with the taker of usury, so the giver of usury. The land shall be emptied and spoiled, for the Lord has spoken this word. Father, in love and brokenness, I come to this congregation with something that you placed on my heart, something prophesied many, many years ago aimed at this very generation and this time. Lord, I pray that you awaken our hearts, that, that we would not tremble, we would not fear, but we would trust your word to bring strength to us. Now, Lord, come upon me by your Holy Spirit. Let me speak the word of the living God with confidence and faith. In Jesus' name I pray, 
Amen. God, through the prophet Isaiah said, a time is coming. God said, I'm going to turn everything upside down. And the scripture makes it very clear. It says, behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste and turneth it upside down. There's a sudden judgment coming to this world. And it's at the door. And I want you to hear what the prophet Isaiah is saying. It's not my message. Now, if you're tied to this world, if you're in love with the things of this world, and you are not walking with the Lord, you're not wanting to hear, you will not want to hear this, and you may want to just cast it aside and say, well, I'll endure this message. It, 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 and even if you are a born-again Christian, if you love the Lord and you're close to him, if you didn't believe that this is the pure word of God, there may be a tendency not to take it serious. But this is the word of God. It is not man's prophecy. There are a lot of prophecies going forth in the world, and, and they are, uh, I don't know whether you would call them scripturally based or not, but this is scripture. This is the living word of God. And if you believe this is the pure word of God, then you have to open your heart to what the prophet Isaiah has to say this morning. In one hour, the world is going to change, the scripture says. In fact, when you get to Revelation 8th chapter, John warned in one day, death and mourning, yea, in one hour, an utter burning and judgment will come. That's the 18th chapter of Revelation. And it confirms that this is going to happen. Jesus said it's going to be when all men cry peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes. A sudden Unexpected destruction comes from the hand of the Lord. Isaiah warns that there, he mentions a city. In fact, a number of prophets do, but most uh, eminent Bible scholars, and I've checked through my library, and they believe, as I do, that this prophecy that we're hearing this morning from Isaiah is, at, is, is directed to this generation. In just a moment, I'll enlarge on that and tell you why I believe we can pinpoint it into our very generation, our time. In one day, in one hour, and he says at that time, there, there was going to be a great burning. Now, secular prophets and those in homeland security, whether it's in the United States or England or Germany, all over the world now, they, they are saying that, that there is going to come a nuclear accident or a nuclear holocaust coming to a city. They often name New York City. You, you know what's happened here. We lived through the 9-11 experience. And you could look out of the apartment, especially where we are, and you could see the burning, you could see the fire and the smoke ascending to heaven. And a few weeks ago, remember the eruption of the steam pipe and uh, the earth opened up and swallowed a truck and you saw pictures of people running everywhere and they're screaming, is this it, is this it? They're thinking nuclear. And the scripture says, if, when you go through Isaiah, the 24th chapter, it, it says that the gates are going to be dissolved. The gates are going to be uh Devastated. That means the exits and entrances. We don't know where it is. The city is named and a burning and a fire is mentioned here. I've been prophesying for a number of years that uh, of something I saw when I was on the street in, in <clears throat> on uh, Broadway and 42nd Street. And it's come back to me many, many times of a thousand bur fires burning in this particular city we, in which we live. But you see, I don't know where it is. He doesn't name the city, but he does say that there, there, there is going to be a sudden destruction that's going to change everything. The world is going to change in one hour. The church is going to change in one hour. And we as individuals are going to change in one hour. Now, this message is not to frighten. Because if, if you're confident that you're saved and under the blood of Christ... And redeemed, you know that anything like this happens, it's instant glory. We pass from life into death. And like the Apostle Paul said, we should be of this mindset, that we thank God for this world. We thank God for our life. But our preference is to go and be with Christ. That should be the desire in your heart. The scripture said the fear of death is a dominion. 
It's a terror. And Paul said, you've lived all your life that way. But he said, God says he doesn't want you to live that way. He wants to deliver us from the fear of death. And if we lose the fear of death through trusting in Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, we will not fear. No matter what happens, what the newscast is, what anybody says, or a message such as this, you, you will only be moved to awaken to what the, the Lord says to do. And let, let me not get ahead of myself here. We don't know where this is going to happen. First of all, the hour is going to come when the whole world is going to change. Now, eminent Bible scholars believe that chapter 24 and 25 of Isaiah have to do with our time this very day. A sudden cataclysmic event is going to strike, and the Bible, Isaiah says, the lofty, this is 26 verse 5, the lofty, meaning the proud city, will be laid low even to the ground. Bible, then, according to the prophet, there is utter chaos. And folks, you can go out in the street here on this Sunday afternoon, go right outside the door on a sunny day, and say, how could it happen that in one hour there could be such confusion where government can't do anything about it, societal agencies can't do anything about it, because even when 9-11 struck this city, they came from all over the world. They poured in from all the United States, firemen, police officers, and helpers, and uh, there was uh, armies of people wanting to help. But, folks, this cataclysmic event makes very, is made very clear in the Scripture it's going to be beyond human ability to cope with. And, and even now, we, we listen to our secular prophets, and they, they talk about trying to prepare, but there, there is... There's coming a day that in one hour, society changes. A whole world changes. The Bible says the merchants will weep and weep and wail and cry because no one is buying their merchandise. They're all sellers and no buyers. This past week, the <clears throat> director or the CEO of a large fund put his 142-foot yacht for sale. His 16-bedroom house in Aspen went up for sale because his high-risk funds are fading and he's in deep trouble and it happened overnight. And, and now all of these risk funds, mortgage companies going bankrupt left and right. And, and we are facing an incredible monster economic upheaval. I've been warning about that. I stood in this pulpit a year ago, this Sunday, I think it was, or, or within one or two Sundays, warning about the mortgage market and telling people if you're flipping houses and you don't know how to do that, you're not a real estate agent, get out. We warned about that. And because you say, well, why warn? What's the purpose of that? Why don't you just wait till it happens? Why live on any kind of anxiety? Why put this burden upon us? But remember what Jesus said when he first saw the destruction of Jerusalem. He said, there's going to be a, this city is going to burn to the ground. And he said, I'm telling you now so that when it happens, you'll believe. You'll believe that there is a God who so loved you. He warns you. And, and he, he said, that it, there's going, this, this, this city is going to the ground and there won't be one stone left upon another in the temple. And Jesus warned. He said, I'm, I'm warning you for a reason. So that when it happens, when you see these things come out, you will understand that you were loved. And, and Paul the Apostle, when he's talking about the sudden destruction, he called that information light. He said, you're members of a body walking in light. You're getting Holy Ghost insight. He said, you're not in the darkness. You won't walk in darkness. So that when these sudden things come, and, and there's panic all around you. There's going to be something happen to you by the Holy Spirit. There's going to be something that quickens you and say, well, my God warned me. There were true, two word, true words that came forth from the pulpit, and we were, we were warned. Even though in this day of prosperity, nobody wants to hear it. I don't want to hear it. But folks, it is here, and I'll tell you why this message is being brought forth this morning before I close. He said, the dreams are going to fade. 
He, he goes on to say that the music is going to fade, of, of the zithers or the guitars, and, and the, the, uh, there's, there's going to be such a change. Everything is going to change in this world in one hour. If, if there were a nuclear attack on Jerusalem or Tel Aviv, any city in Israel, I told you about the Samson option, and, and they have such a radar system, they have such protective uh, equipment that as soon as a missile's released toward Israel, within moments, they have about a minute, maybe a minute and a half, according to some experts, and retaliatory missiles would hit and strike and wipe out every enemy of Israel. Folks, I'm going to talk to you in just a, a moment about why I believe that the, that the prophet Isaiah is talking about our day. First of all, by the growing number of prophets warning of an apocalyptic moment coming. Now, when I talk about prophets, I'm not talking about just church prophets. I'm talking about secular prophets because God uses secular prophets. These are experts. These are scientists. And remember in the scripture, God said of, of Assyria, Assyria is my rod against Israel to correct them. In other words, Assyria is doing my will. I am speaking through Assyria to my people. And remember also about Cyrus. The scripture said of Cyrus, he's a heathen king. And when you get to Amos, Amos the prophet said, Cyrus is God speaking through him, said, Cyrus is my shepherd and he's doing my bidding. So when, when you hear all of these secular uh, scientists and all of these these are not church people. These are not religious people. They're, they are saying it's at the door. Uh, what about the sensuality? What about all of this nonchalance? What about this racing for money and gold and greed? Wall Street has become the greediest source of, of, of vile corruption in man's history. They have taken this nation into such risk and such depth, the debt, there is no way out of it. And we live right at the foot of, we, it, it's right at the, <clears throat> just blocks away from where I'm preaching this morning. And the second reason, you, you see, what I'm preaching this morning is mild compared to what I hear now. Is that right or wrong? What you hear in the news and what you hear constantly fed so that we just want to turn it off. But you see, God moves. God moves in. <clears throat> these, these are the warning times when prophets are speaking because the scripture says the Lord <clears throat> will do nothing until he speaks through his prophets, through Amos. God said, I don't do anything until I warn through my prophets. And the second reason why... I believe we can assume that what Isaiah is warning speaks to our generation. God always moves in judgment. He always acts when the cup of violence overflows. Violence. Now, folks, let me speak plainly to you from the depths of my soul. I'm not a prophet. I've never claimed to be a prophet. I'm a watchman. Just one of many. But listen to me now. There is no greater violence in the sight of God than the violence of pedophiles. Those who are raping children. Those who are stealing children right off the streets and taking them to, to the Far East and putting them in brothels in India and all the, the Far East. And, and here in the United States, an entire church denomination paying hundreds of millions of dollars to settle lawsuits because their little children were sodomized. Folks, when you turn to Dafar and you find that hundreds and even thousands of little children were shedded to death. 
When you think of the thousands and thousands of babies aborted in the United States and around the world. And that blood cries from the ground. And the Bible says God destroyed Noah's age because the earth was filled with violence. And God said, I can't handle it anymore. I can't take it. I will not take it. And he was patient for 120 years of strong, faithful preaching, a prophetic word. And then God saw. And folks, I believe now, think of the, the murdering in our schools, the, the terrorizing of our children. You can hard. What are we doing? Getting hardened to the news? Does it not move us anymore? I can tell you it moves the heart of God. And I believe that blood cries from the ground. How long do you think God will endure? How long do you think God will put up with this? Even here now on the Internet, a pedophile is taking pictures and and telling pedophiles where to go to find the children where it's easiest to pick up a child. And he's allowed to do it and can't be stopped. Folks, that's all going to change. This is all going to change in one hour. Secondly, sudden destruction... When it comes, is going to change the church. In one hour, the church is going to change. It's going to change dead churches. It's going to change live churches. The prophet pictures a great shaking as though God took an olive tree that had already been harvested, and he begins to shake it. In other words, there's been a harvest, but there's still, God said, I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken. I'm, I'm going to turn everything upside down, according to the prophet. In this time of shaking, though, something is going to happen that's so incredible. If you have your Bibles open, I want you to go to verse 14. Now, before you do that, don't get ahead of me, please. Look this way. Now, remember, this is a time... Of, of cataclysmic devastation. This is a time that's so incredibly dark. This is a time of fire. And in the middle of that, what about God's people? What's happening in the church? The apostasy is going to change overnight. Everything that we see that is Wrong in the church of Jesus Christ is going to change. But in the house of God, there's going to be a revival. And I want you to see it, folks. And if you, it, it, this one, I, I saw it and began to pray over it and began to study and do my research on this. See, this is not, I didn't get along with God and pray and say, God, talk to me. Put in my head what's going to happen. I have people all over the world, wherever I travel, say, Brother Dave, you speak of prophetic. What's, what's next? What's coming? I said, I don't know. I don't know. I'll go to my Bible. If God speaks it through his word, then I believe it and then I'll preach it. So I see this and it makes me shout. I know what's coming and you know what's coming. But folks think God's interest is in his church, in the church of Jesus Christ, his overcoming church. And the Bible said in the middle of this, there's going to be a song rise up from the islands of the sea, from the uttermost parts of the world, there's going to be a song rise up in the middle of all of this. Look at it, verse 14. Then shall they lift up, first, verse 13, when thus it shall be in the midst of the land among the people, there's going to be a great shaking. What's happening during the shaking? Verse 13, verse 14. Then they, in other words, they shall lift up their voice, they shall sing, For the majesty of the Lord, they shall cry aloud from the sea. Wherefore, glorify you the Lord in the fires. Did you hear it? (laughs) There should be an amen coming from the glory of your soul. Because in the middle of the fire, God's going to have a people who are not in panic. 
God is going to have a people that are going to praise the majesty of Almighty God. He said, in the fires you will sing. There's a song coming to the church of Jesus Christ. Folks, we're not going down. We're going up. We are going up. There shall be a song in the midst of the fire. <clears throat> Verse 16, for the, from the uttermost part of the earth, have we heard what? Not weeping, not groaning, not murmuring, not complaining, not agonizing. That you hear a song coming from China, and then you hear it from India. You hear it coming out of the tribes of Africa, out of Darfur, out of every nation. It's coming from every island of the sea. It's coming from the United States and Canada, South America, the whole world, for the uttermost part of the world. I hear a song, the prophet said. I hear it. I hear people who are facing calamity. I hear people that uh, seemingly have no hope, and there's a song. There's a choir. We heard over 150 voices here this morning singing. Can you imagine the great sound that was coming out of the 150? Can you imagine millions and millions of people around the world singing the song when this hour comes? It's coming in the darkest time of all. I, I, I believe that... <clears throat> that something's going to happen among our youth, especially college students. Do you understand that for, for the past 10 years especially, our children, our young people are going into colleges and their faith is being robbed? That ungodly atheistic teachers and professors have our young people as prisoners for three, four, five, and six years. And they keep bombarding them till there's no faith. They, they leave believing there is no God. Till like in Sweden, 80% of the people now say that the population that there's no God, don't believe in God, 20% believe in God. And many, many students and folks, I believe that's going to change because in one hour when everybody is waking and when the world is shaking and trembling, those professors are going to be looking for somebody to give them a word. Prosperity preachers are going to get their Bibles out looking for something to say to the people saying, what's happened? Why didn't you warn us? But I believe that in that time, everything in college is going to change. Oh, yes. All the survivors. You see, this is not, I'm not talking about the end of the world. There's still ahead. There's, the, 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 things are going to change in one hour. But there's still, we're talking about in the future beyond that, the Antichrist. And, but you see, the Antichrist can't come to power until there's chaos. It has to come out of chaos. Hitler came out of chaos. The Antichrist is going to come out of a chaotic world where he, there, there is something of wisdom. There's something given to him, a demonic power that brings people some kind of hope. I'm talking about the secular world. But folks, this is all about to change. Now the Bible says we as individuals are going to change. In one hour, we're going to have our focus in life changed, our entire focus. We will no longer be obsessing about our own problems and adversities. We won't be, we won't be focused on me. We won't be focused on our problems as serious as they are and, and as challenging as they may be. God, it's very clear. This will not be our focus. That's all going to be changed. Everything that was once dear to us, it's, it's no longer going to have value it's, it, other than those things that are of the spirit and of love and of Christ. Things that we held dear are, are going to be held and, and absolutely are going to vanish. By this, meaning the calamity, shall the iniquity of Jacob be purged when he turns all the stones into dust. This is Isaiah 27.9. He said, I'm going to take all the idols. And he said, by this, in other words, this great cataclysmic event is going to bring down all the idols. All the idols are going to be crushed to stone, is what the Bible says. Here's the promise from the book of Isaiah, 27th chapter. He said, in that day, all the idols will be trampled to dust. 
They're not going to, the last thing the world's going to be talking about is sports. I have nothing sports. I like sports. I'm a football fan. But, you know, the Bible says it's going to be good. They're not going to be any more $250 million settlement for these people in a starving world. He said it's all going to change. It goes even deeper than that. Let me find it here in the Scripture. It shall be... Here's where we're going to be in a level fifth. Listen to this very please. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with his master, as with the maid, so with his mistress, or the buyer and the seller, as with the lender and the buyer. Everything will be brought to a same level. Whether it's presidents, world leaders, those in poverty, all going to face the same struggles, the same conditions. <clears throat> Nothing will There'll be no respecter of persons. Are you ready for some comfort? (laughs) I said, are you ready for some comfort? (sighs) Folks, I don't like to preach like this. For the last six weeks, I've preached nothing but grace. I risk people getting mad. Every time I've had to preach much like this, people leave. But one day I stand before God. And he said, if you see these things coming and you don't warn, the blood's on your hand. And I read that and tremble. There should be no one that comes to Times Square Church surprised. Should, you don't sit around waiting for things to happen. But let me tell you what Paul the Apostle said. I want you to follow this very closely before I close. Paul said, <clears throat> He has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we wake or sleep, whether we, we, we will live together with him. He said, comfort yourself. He, he's talking about sudden destruction. He's talking about time that we're going to be with the Lord. And he said, I want you to comfort one another. Comfort one another. And he said, whether we live or die. And folks, that's where we have to come to right now. You, you, you watch the news in the next 30 days and especially the next two weeks. Yeah, listen to, to what's happening to the economy. Listen and just remember God speaking, not to make you afraid, but to prepare your heart. He said, you're to put on the breastplate of faith. This is Paul the Apostle said, in these times, when we live under the threat of a sudden destruction or the knowledge of a sudden destruction coming on the earth, when, when, when this has been told to us and when we see it and we hear it, He said, you're not to tremble, you're not to sorrow as the world sorrows. He said, no. He said, you go about comforting one another and speak to one another, saying, live or die, we're the Lord's. Now, it comes down to this, going to your friends, going to the body of Christ, went after them and shake hands and look right in the eye and say, live or die, we're the Lord's. That's what Paul said. You're going to encourage one another and say, we live or die, we will go and live with Christ. We are headed for eternal life in Christ. Folks, I'm asking God, and I I, more and more, you say, well, you can come to that because you're old man now. But you see, I'm coming to a place now where I'm not going to live in fear. I don't live in fear. I want to be here in the United States. I want to be here in New York City if anything happens to this city. I want to be here in the middle of it. And I don't want the fear of death to have dominion over me. And you can't have freedom. You can't have freedom until you comfort yourself with the word of God, saying, I will, whatever happens, if it happens tomorrow, bless God, I'm going to be shouting on the streets of glory with all the saints of God. I'm going to pass from death into life. This, we're not to live in fear. We're not to live in bondage. 
You say, well, Brother Dave, you already put us in fear and now you're trying to get us out of it. No, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Glory be to God. I, I, my message today is that there's a song coming out of this. And if you leave this building, if you leave this building discouraged, if you walk out of here and say that's nothing but gloom and doom, yes, it is on a human level. But on a spiritual level, it's life eternal. It's life. And I just have a secret thought in my heart. It's probably just David Wilkerson's thoughts. But I have a feeling, just as before 9-11, the Holy Spirit moved in this church and other congregations and warned us there were moments of silence. Sometime 15 minutes we sat in this church just before the blast. And God was speaking to us not to be afraid. And I, it's going to be different this time. I believe that if something is going to happen in this city or wherever it happens, the saints of God are going to be quickened by the Holy Spirit and there are going to be some singing and shouting and praising of God to encourage the body to strengthen their spirit. Now get up on your feet. I bind the spirit of fear in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. He's not given us the spirit of fear, but love and power and a sound mind. Folks, I've got the Holy Ghost all over me right now. I have the Holy Spirit upon my soul. He wants to come upon you. The Holy Spirit wants to quicken you. Take the fear out of your heart. You young people that are in the choir, the young people that are listening to me right now, there is a future. There, the whole world thinks there's no future. Folks, this is just the beginning of our future. This is just the beginning of our future. Hallelujah. I feel good. There are going to be a lot of people listening to this tape, tuned it out too quick. They turned it off. They should have stayed. And listen to the praises and the shouts of God's people in this house. <laughs> Hallelujah. There shall be a song. Somebody asked you this afternoon or tomorrow next week, what did Pastor Dave preach? You say, revival. A song in a hard time. And I've got to say this in closing. Listen very carefully, please. You're to sing in your present fire, in your adver ad adversity, in your hard time, financial, whatever it may be. You've got to get a song. You say, does God expect me to sing? I don't care what it is. There should be that little quiet. There's something very quiet and steadfast in the soul that sings, great is our God. See, he said they're going to sing about the majesty of God. Great is our God. Folks, I walk these streets and I sing. I sing in spite of, of, of crises. I sing in spite of all those things. There's something God puts in the heart. And you've got to get your song now. That'll be too late. Get it now. Get a hold of your song. There's a song in the night, but there's a song in the fire. Some of you are in a fire. The Bible says, build up your faith. The apostle Paul said, put on the breastplate of hope, uh, uh, of faith and love and hope. Oh, praise God for the hope that is in our hearts. Now, we have a, a space here in the front of the church. We, we refer to it as the altar, another place to meet God. And I invite you, if you're here this morning, and God has spoken to you. You see, uh, God's not interested in you changing your life through fear, but through hope. And that's what this meeting is all about, hope. And you're here this morning, and your hope 
has been staggered because you're going through a crisis in your life. And you say, well, Brother Dave, everybody's got some kind of a crisis. But I'm talking about a, a real serious thing that, that only God could give you a song. And there's been some, we call it the blues or depression. If you're standing here, with the sound of my voice in the annex upstairs here, wherever we're at in this audience. And you need a touch, an absolute touch of God. You need the spirit of fear to be broken in you. So you can walk out of this building. Maybe that fear is because you're not walking with Christ as you did or should. Maybe you've drifted away. Maybe you walked in here and you've never known what it is to have what people call a new birth or you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. I invite you to get out of your seat upstairs, wherever you are, and even in the annex, you can go to the lobby and they'll show you how to get down here in the front of this church and we will pray for you. You can come even while I'm talking. Just get out of your seat, up the balcony, go the stairs on either side and come down. And we're going to believe God for a, a tremendous uh, change. Everything's a change in our... This can change you in the next five minutes. There can be a change in your life, and the Lord can cleanse you, change your direction, and bring hope and life to your whole, your body, soul, mind, and the spirit. Heavenly Father, I pray that you walk through this congregation move through this congregation and find everyone that needs a miracle, a life-changing miracle, and those who would believe with us, would believe with us for that change in Jesus' name. And while they're singing, just get out of your seat, up in the balcony, come and join us here, and we'll pray and we'll believe God for you and with you. If you don't know Christ, if you've drifted from Christ, follow these that are coming. Now, there's some, maybe many of you here this morning, Worried and fretting. Pastor Dave, what do, I, what do I do in the future? If some of these things you're talking about even begin to happen, what do we do? What about my house, my mortgage, all of these things? The Lord comes to us with a message that casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. Can, can you imagine a God who has flung into the cosmos, not just this one uh, world that we're living in, not this one galaxy, but you understand that there are millions and billions of galaxies beyond ours. The, the Hubble uh, telescope has discovered not just uh, billions of, they're talking about billions of universes. Can you imagine? Endless. And a God who can keep all of that in order. Can't he keep our lives in order? My goodness. And, and, and we have preached faith so long. We have toyed with faith. We have imagined. We have faith. We have talked and preached and, and, and tried to test it and all, but folks, that it, it is time. It is time, and the only reason I can think God would have me do this this morning is that you and I get a hold of some life-changing faith that no matter what happens, somehow God will deliver his people. It, and if, if, if we, if, folks, how do, you, how do you explain the 16 Korean Presbyterians right now in the hands of the Afghan uh, terror, uh, Taliban? Two have been murdered. And then, then we say, well, you know, the fiery furnace and the lion's den, they're all delivered and God's not appointed us to wrath. Yes, but there's, there, there are two and they're dying one at a time. There are martyrs under the throne of God, multitudes of martyrs crying out that their blood be avenged. F folks, we've got to be honest about it. We've got to be honest. I'm not going to play games with the church of Jesus Christ. You and I have, you and I have to be prepared to die for Jesus if necessary. And we will go through hard times. But if a God can, if a God can keep this world in orbit and 
there's a whole cosmos moving in their orbits and in their places. And can you imagine a God who's named every billions of stars, every multiplied billions of stars, he's named them all. So he sure knows my name. He knows my name and he knows your name. God, help us to believe God and get a song in our trial. Father, in Jesus' name, we fight against doubt and unbelief and this cast down spirit. Lord, help us to face the days ahead with Holy Ghost courage. And you are a strong tower and we can run into you and be safe. We are safe in Christ. Pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, give me confidence in the days ahead. And I trust in you. And help me, O Lord, to cast my cares upon you. Forgive my sins, Lord. Forgive my unbelief. Come by your Holy Spirit. Lift my spirit. Put joy in my heart. And a song in my heart of praise and glory to your holy name. Now let me pray again for the Father. Sweep over this congregation in the annex, the overflow rooms, into the balcony and the choir loft and the pulpit and this whole house. Sweep over us with the gentle spirit of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, just breathe upon us now. As we walk out into the sunlight of this day, let us realize, Lord, that this is not the sun that we're looking for. We thank you for it. But, oh, Lord, we, we go into a city where the, you are the sun. You are the brightness of the day. And, Lord, you will wipe away every tear and you will strengthen us. Lord, we anticipate your coming. We anticipate the soon return of Jesus Christ, our Lord, from glory. Hallelujah. Will you now just thank him for his faithfulness to you? Lord, I thank you.